Thank you for joining us for Facebook Live with Professor Tamara Thornton. Hello. We are going to be discussing her recent biography on Nathaniel Bowditch. About did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, it's Bowditch. <laughs> Bowditch. It's Bowditch. I've met modern day Bowditches and they have been very pleased that I've gotten the name <laughs> pronounced correctly. <laughs> so what intrigued you about Nathaniel Bowditch? I think what first intrigued me was that I could not figure this guy out. I had done a lot of work in his area, literally geographic area and time period. I had done work on Boston in the early Republic before. So I kind of figured, well, I'm going to pretty much be able to figure him out. But he was a puzzle to me, mainly because he had three different careers that just didn't seem to fit together. So he was a navigator and wrote a navigation manual that was the, they called it the Siemens Bible of the 19th century. But then he also wanted to be a big time scientist who would get known in Europe. He wanted to run with the big boys. And then he had a day job. So he's doing all three of these things at the same time. His day job is working as what we would call a financial industry executive. And I, that, kind of blew my circuit. So what what kind of person does these three things and what kind of world is it where doing these three things at the same time makes sense? And what I found is it's not a case of somebody leading three separate lives. There's a theme that runs through all three of them, which is the title of the book, The Power of Numbers. It's actually a quotation. <laughs> um, and uh, Studying the power of numbers, thinking about quantification, a scientific worldview, a systematic worldview, as brought to business as well as science, that's really what I found fascinating. So not getting him got me interested, and then once I got him, I was really interested. So he sounds very much like the Leonardo da Vinci of his period. Does he that he is the, almost the renaissance man of the enlightenment, doing all of these different tasks and jobs, but focusing in on one theme. Does he seem like the enlightenment, the enlightenment man, almost the renaissance man? He was an enlightenment man. I wouldn't say so much a renaissance man. He didn't have that kind of imagination, you know, where he's doing art and science and this, that, and the other, and able to see the world in a lot of different ways. He saw the world in one way which was through the lens of essentially a mathematician and a systematizer. And this is what he was doing with everything. So he very much believed in order and system and exactitude and certainty, all of these mathematical values. Everything for him was plus or minus, no gray area. Um, black or white, not lots and lots of color. So in that way, he's not a da Vinci. Um, Everything had to be systematized, organized, cataloged, numbered, filed, and invented filing systems. Really, he's a systematizer. Uh, and that is the way he approached how to navigate across the oceans. It's the way he approached how to think about the solar system. And it's certainly the way he approached how to conduct business, which, you know, before Bowditch, business was actually a really unsystematic kind of enterprise. And what he had learned as a scientist and as a mathematician were these systematizing ways. And he brings them to business and introduces really modern bureaucracy, things like blank forms, uh, numbering systems, cataloging systems, classification systems, everything from museum accession numbers to really all the blank forms that we have. You know, you sign up for Facebook, you have to fill out the form. That's a new experience in the early 1800s, and it's something that Bowditch is actually very much involved in um, establishing. So when we think about modern bureaucracy, modern life, feeling like a number instead of a name, having to fill out forms, um, it's that's modern life, but modern life becomes modern because people make it modern. And Bowditch was one of the people who made it modern. So would you say his greatest accomplishment was in the field of business versus um, navigation or science? Yeah, I would say it was business. That's where it's most invisible. Um, it was, it, it's invisible now because we take all this stuff for granted. Mm -hmm. 
So the history has, the deep history has just kind of disappeared. Um, in his day, he yearned to be a, a famous scientist, but he wasn't really original. He was very accomplished. He was a hugely accomplished mathematician and taught himself all of this cutting edge stuff that nobody else in America really knew. But he wasn't inventive. He wasn't making anything new in science. And Europeans knew that, and he knew it too. He knew it about himself. In navigation, he put together this great book. Um, it was an improvement on manuals of the sort. Uh, couldn't be entirely original. You can't be entirely original when most of the book is, is made up of mathematical tables. You don't want to pull numbers <laughs> out of the air. Uh, but this was more accurate. Um, so he got famous because of that, and Americans like to think that, oh, he, he's a, a European-level scientist, but really his major accomplishments came in the realm of business, in establishing a, a systematic um, approach to business conduct that, that we take for granted today, whether it's filling out a blank form or you have to pay your loan on time uh, or uh, every document's going to have a number on it. That's Bowditch. So why don't we remember him today? You start your book out by stating that in his day and age, everyone knew who Bowditch was. Yeah. Why don't we remember him today yeah. then? Again, I think because the stuff he established, the really important stuff that he established, just became normalized. And so we don't think that this is something that somebody invented. It's just what life has always been like or what modern life has always been like. So we don't think, and who, who's going to go and look at the origin of a blank form, right? I mean, we'll look at the origin of the phonograph or something yeah. like that or the computer, but a blank form, really, it's so prosaic. But think about how much impact that has on your life. So I think that these are everyday things, everyday experience. It disappears. Um, his scientific reputation, well, he just didn't come up with anything good enough, frankly, or original enough. He's not going to be remembered for that. That's what would kill him, because mm -hmm. that's what he wanted to be remembered for. Uh, the navigation manual, that... People who are in the maritime world, they all know Bowditch. Uh, they know his book, but that's a relatively small world. Everybody in the Navy knows him, the Coast Guard. I've given book talks before where these old Coast Guard and Navy retirees come up to me with their old, their Bowditch book. It's a much revised version, <laughs> uh, but they want me to sign it for them. And they, they tell me all the Bowditch stories, how they took Bowditch with them across the Pacific. And so they know, um, but hey, if you're not on the water, you're not going to know <laughs> unless you read my book. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about the development of your book. I was fascinated by, in your acknowledgments, you acknowledged many faculty members within our department. Mm -hmm. Could you expand upon how the intellectual atmosphere of the history department helped you develop the mm -hmm. book, your argument and the writing? Mm -hmm. aspect? Well, that happens on a lot of levels. You know, one is this is a department that really values scholarship. We respect each other as colleagues for our scholarship. Our teaching is well, but we do feel pride in our scholarship when we pat each other on the back for it. So it's just a supportive environment in that way. You don't have to explain yourself or apologize for yourself um, that you're doing this kind of thing. There are also just a whole lot of smart people here. It's, it's a small department, and so we don't necessarily have somebody else who does exactly what we do that we we can consult. But frankly, the way historians work, we tend to seek out colleagues from around the country at conferences and exchange work that way. So that in that way, it's not so unusual. But a smart person, even if that person is not directly in your field, can really help. And I certainly had colleagues who uh, heard me give talks on campus, commented on it, gave me feedback, and that was incredibly useful. And sometimes it's something very specific. Um, there was one document that I had. It was a letter, handwritten letter in French from the early 19th century. A French mathematician was writing Bowditch. Um, and I, I can make my way through French, and I had translated some of these things myself. But 
that letter, the guy's handwriting was so bad, oh, no. I couldn't do it, and I knew it was important. So I gave it to Dr. Vardy. She's a native speaker. She can do this, and of course, it was a breeze for her, and she gave me a beautiful translation. So sometimes it's something just like that. Mm -hmm. You can go to your friend down the hall and ask her. Uh, so on many different levels, um, being in a supportive department is great. And it definitely shows in the book you the book is absolutely wonderful and Thank it's you. absolutely fabulous. You definitely deserve to win the various awards it did. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us Thank for the so Facebook much. Live. I enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us as well.